Marketing, welcoming you to this installment of the Practice Perfection Web-Based Education Series. Today's presentation is entitled, Pneumopedics and Craniofacial Epigenetics, a new way to treat obstructive sleep apnea in a multidisciplinary dental setting, and will be delivered by our very special guest, Dr. Dave Singh. Professor Singh is CEO and Chairman of Biomodeling Solutions, Inc. He is a member of the World Association of Sleep Medicine, the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, Academic Fellow of the World Federation of Orthodontists, and Senior Instructor, Consultant, and Fellow of the International Association for Orthodontics, where he was awarded prizes in 2005, 2013, and 2014. He is also a member in good standing of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain. Professor Singh was visiting professor in orthodontics at the University of Michigan, University of Erlanga, Indonesia, and University of Sains, Malaysia, associate professor at the Center for Craniofacial Disorders, University of Puerto Rico, adjunct professor at Portland State University, and a director of continuing education for the SMILE Foundation. Dr. Singh lectures extensively, both nationally and internationally, and has been published in the peer-reviewed medical, orthodontic, and dental literature. He is co-author of the book, Epigenetic Orthodontics in Adults. In this hard-hitting and groundbreaking presentation, Dr. Singh introduces the principles of craniofacial epigenetics, including epigenetic orthopedics and epigenetic orthodontics, as well as the novel concept of pneumopedics, or non-surgical upper airway remodeling. He then explains the idea of biomimetic oral appliance therapy and its application as a potential cure for obstructive sleep apnea in a multidisciplinary dental setting. Attendees at today's presentation will gain knowledge of new OSA treatments for adults, learn to co-manage patients with MDs, improve 3D CBCT diagnostic skills, understand craniofacial growth and epigenetics, and gain new perspectives on pediatric OSA. In other words, everything the practice committed to an oral systemic model could possibly ask for and more. Now before we get to today's event and very special presenter, I want you to know that Practice Perfection webcasts run for around 90 minutes. While attendees are in listen-only mode, we invite you at any time to submit your questions or comments using the question button on your screen. We will allow time following the presentation to get your questions answered. If we're not able to get to your question during the webcast, we will see that they're answered shortly thereafter. Those who view this presentation may apply to receive one and a half hours of continuing education credit. Shortly following the webcast, you will receive instructions on how to receive your credit. Participants are cautioned about the dangers of incorporating techniques and procedures into their practices if the course has not provided them with adequate clinical experience to allow them to perform it competently. And now, it is a real pleasure to welcome to the Practice Perfection stage, Professor David Singh. Hello, David. Hi, Danny. Um, thank you so much for that very comprehensive uh, introduction. And I want to thank everyone uh, for their time uh, just before the bank for, before the weekend to uh, attend this uh, presentation. So we're going to talk uh, this evening about pneumopedics and craniofacial epigenetics. And um, so here is the, uh, pra the Practice Perfection series, which I'm, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be part of this. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's do a bit of an introduction. Um, I'm based here in Beaverton, Oregon. We're about 20 minutes west of Portland, a uh, great part of the country to be in, you know, particularly at this time of year. And uh, we run training and seminars uh, and diagnostic facilities uh, from our office here. And uh, if you're in this part of the country, very welcome to uh, visit us at any point. Um, as was briefly mentioned by Danny, I am a member of the World Association of Sleep Medicine. And you'll probably recognize this young man on the left side. This is Professor Giminel from Stanford University. And the guys here on the right side are from the Mayo Clinic. So there's a lot of interest in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. And most recently, I've been approached by the American Sleep and Breathing Academy 
it's a very special academy uh, for lots of different reasons. One of which it champions champions the cause of dental sleep medicine to the extent where they are having a meeting at the U.S. Senate uh, in the fall, and they've actually been asked to speak on behalf of the dental profession at that U.S. Senate meeting and to represent dentists who are interested in sleep apnea. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me to be you know, working in this area of the world, and I want to thank the American Sleep and Breathing Academy for um, extending the invitation to me also. So a uh, conflict of interest disclosure, um, I'm CEO and Chairman of Biomodeling Solutions. Um, Biomodeling is registered as a medical device facility with the FDA. All the DNA appliances are FDA registered and the mRNA appliance is FDA cleared for mild to moderate sleep apnea. So all the devices that you will see in today's presentation, they've all been through the approval process. In fact, there are specific billing codes which, uh, uh, which apply to um, that DNA appliance system. And here you see um, some of the patents that go with that technology. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the CDIS presentation. You know, Dr. Gimena, what he said is that there's a interaction between craniofacial morphology and upper airway adequacy. And that's a very profound statement. And what it's really saying is that the shape and size of the face, including the jaws and teeth, has a major impact on the upper airway. And as you know, that is critical for life, for breathing, and for sleep. So what we're going to be doing uh, in this presentation is looking at some of the ideas in terms of what do you mean by craniofacial epigenetics, and that includes things like epigenetic orthopedics as well as epigenetic orthodontics. So these are new words which are describing phenomenon that will be seen clinically, and the research is showing more and more support for these ideas. And then tonight I'm going to also talk about the idea of pneumopedics. So orthodontics, as we know, is moving teeth. And orthopedics, as you know, is remodeling bone. And now we have the idea of pneumopedics, which is remodeling the upper airway. Now, the advantage of pneumopedics is that it's non-surgical and drug-free. And so that's the idea in terms of working with the body on a biomimetic basis. And so here we're talking about these biomimetic oral appliances. So there are fixed appliances, there are removal appliances, and there are functional appliances historically. And that classification doesn't really tell us how the appliances do their work. In addition, there's several, I mean hundreds, uh, hundreds of oral appliances out there for um, mandibular advancement devices for sleep apnea. But what we have here is the idea of a biomimetic oral appliance, which is going to target the site and the severity of the obstruction in terms of correcting sleep apnea. So the overall idea is to apply these new concepts as a potential cure for sleep apnea in a multidisciplinary dental setting. And that, again, is a critical phase because sleep apnea is a medical condition. We're going to be using medical billing codes uh, for the reimbursement side. And so we need to work with the medical professionals, specifically for the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic components. And so we know that there are large chunks of patients out there who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea who are unable to, um, to comply with a protocol such as a CPAP mask. And we also know that there are many, many patients who remain undiagnosed. And so the idea is to have the medical model in the dental office. And so you'll be working with a medical director who will help you to um, actually diagnose and review the patient. But you, as a dental practitioner, are actually doing the therapy using these biomedic oral devices. Does anyone have a bulldog? And uh, does anyone know how many mammals snore? Well, one of them is a bulldog, and the other one, of course, are humans. And so if you have a patient that's been diagnosed with snoring, mild or moderate sleep apnea, currently people are saying that let's use a mandibular advancement device to address that issue. So here's a bulldog, and here it is from the profile. And now we have to ask the question is, do I need mandibular advancement? <laughs> and so like we know, yes, there are a large number of patients who present to the dental office with a class 3 phenotype, with a class 3 appearance, which means the jaw is already protruded. 
Now, if those patients all also have sleep apnea, the question is, where am I going to put that mandible? It's already protruded. So we need a protocol that can address class 1, class 2, and even class 3 cases. And if we say, well, class 3 isn't that common, let's go to a place like Asia, where approximately 45 to 50 percent of orthodontic patients present with a class 3 malocclusion seeking treatment. So let's ask another question. The class 3 is, of course, a phenotype. And so now the genes have produced a class 3 phenotype. Can we change this phenotype non-surgically? In other words, can I change this phenotype epigenetically? So we know that the genes are producing phenotypes, but the idea now is that we can have an epigenetic response to actually change the phenotype. In other words, we can take this facial shape and remodel it and make it look different so it functions and actually looks better. So one way of causing sleep apnea is to have deficient craniofacial morphology, but another way of causing patients is for patients to be obese. So a patient who's overweight. So here's a fat mouse from New Zealand. And when this mouse is sleeping, it stands up. And the reason it does that is because it wants to maintain its airway. If it lies down flat, it will squish its airway and it won't wake up. So that's what patients do is they, they are going to go into a different posture to try to keep the airway open. That's during nighttime, but also during the daytime. So we have to think about how is sleep apnea caused in various types of patients. Now, in the obese patients, they can be depositing fat all over their body, including inside the tongue and including the parapharyngeal spaces in the throat. So if you've got a very large tongue, it makes sense to have large jaws so you can accommodate the tongue and you prevent it from causing airway obstruction when that patient sleeps. So let's look at a summary of how the airway can be compromised. Let's take the first row here. These are normal patients. They've got a normal amount of soft tissue. Their bony size of the jaws is quite normal. And their airway size is normal. Therefore, they don't have any sleep apnea. The second row shows patients who are obese and they have an excess amount of soft tissue. The jaw size is normal but the soft tissue pressure is causing airway collapse, and those patients are at high risk of developing sleep apnea. Now, the third group is the bottom row here, and these patients are non-obese because they have the normal amount of soft tissue. However, their jaws are small. The bone enclosure, the upper and lower jaws, are smaller than usual, and so we have an increased tissue pressure again, and now these patients are at risk of developing sleep apnea. So it would make some sense for us to say, let's target the tissues that are actually causing the underlying etiology of the sleep apnea. And if you look at the craniofacial region, we've got soft tissues, we've got hard tissues, we've got functional spaces, which of course is the airway, but then we have these special tissues called teeth. So what about teeth? Do they have any impact on the airway and do they have any impact on sleep apnea? And the short answer is probably yes. And that's a short answer to a very complex question. But the, here's the thing, is that the teeth are attached to the bone. And so we know that the airway is going to be interacting with the bony morphology. And so can we use the teeth to communicate with the underlying bony foundation? And can that bony foundation then target the airway for correction? Those are the kind of concepts that we're going to be looking at uh, as the seminar goes on. So the basis for doing this is an epigenetic approach. Now we know about genes and the genome. So you know what Darwin said is that the genotype is going to define the phenotype. Okay, but now we have this idea of epigenetics, and we're going to actually change the phenotype without changing the DNA sequence. So we're not changing the genes, but we're changing the way that those genes are going to be expressed. And those changes are mediated by the attachments of chemical groups to the DNA and the proteins, histones, and chromatin, which surround the DNA. And so that region is called the epigenome. So just think of a, you know, a sticker bar or a candy bar. There's a wrapper that goes around it. And so the epigenome is the wrapper which is around the genes 
and this wrapper is reactive to um, environmental signals. And so what we can do is we can get epigenetic modification. These are biochemical reactions that the epigenome undergoes, and that allows the underlying genes to be expressed slightly differently. And so it's a, com it's a different combination of the same genes, which is actually producing a different outcome, a variation, or a change in the phenotype. And what we see here is a list of those kind of biochemical reactions, uh, revelization, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, <coughs> simulation, and ubiquination. Now, these look like um, pretty complex reactions, which they are. But let's take methylation for an for example here. We often uh, recommend to women of childbearing age that they should be on a folate supplement, taking folic acid. And we know that folate prevents neural tube defects, such as spina bifida, cleft from palate, that sort of stuff, and so we have healthier babies. And so what is the folate actually doing? Well, the, the folate is a methyl donor. And so there's an example of an epigenetic um, kind of uh, protocol whereby you've added folate to the diet, and that's produced the healthy baby through an epigenetic process. Now, the, the human genome, it's a bit like the, uh, the human epigenome, it's a bit like the human genome. So here's a uh, news article from the New York Times about a year ago. 200 scientists are working on this project to understand the complicated system of, of switches that regulate genes. So each gene, each cell has the same number of genes, but those genes have been expressed differently. Genes can be upregulated, they can be downregulated, there's modulation of those genes. And what these scientists are hoping to do is to discover new ways to treat these diseases or even cure these diseases. And so this, is, this includes diseases such as sleep apnea. There may be a potential cure which is very close to us and almost in our hands. So we talked a little about epigenetics. Now what about biomimetics? What do you mean by that? Well, anyone who goes fishing will know that we can use this little um, decoy kind of uh, fish here to affect the behavior of larger fish. So what we're doing here is mimicking nature. And so what we see here is an ax. Okay, it's been redesigned to the kind of, uh, the kind of shape and size of a woodpecker. Woodpeckers are very efficient at removing wood. And so what we're doing is taking a natural model and trying to replicate that to get a better outcome. So what is biomimetics? It's a science. It studies natural models and uses these designs and processes to solve human problems. So we're looking for a natural model of the human. Now what do we know about the modern human? Well, pretty much symmetrical on the outside of the body. Go from the head right down to the toes. But the human body is pretty symmetrical, okay? If you go inside the human body, you know, the thorax and the abdomen, there you will find asymmetry. The asymmetry is not an accident. It's actually directional asymmetry. It's, it's uh, part of the whole idea of fluctuating asymmetry. And so what the human body has a natural model to be symmetrical on the outside. Let's think about human enamel. As you remember, recall from enamel is derived from surface ectoderm. And so technically, enamel or teeth are on the outside of the body, and they're supposed to be symmetric. And then think about the human body. You know, we've got you know, two eyes, we've got 10 fingers, and 32 teeth. That is the replica. That is the model that we're trying to replicate. And we know that's taken millennia to evolve to a high degree of efficiency, a high degree of survivability. And how are we going to replicate that model? By using specific processes, and those processes are developmental processes. So development is encoded by genes. And those are the genes that you, were, that you inherited, that you were born with, and that you keep for life. And so what we're going to do is target those genes and saying, can you do some redevelopment, which you are encoded to do, if I give you an appropriate environmental signal? And that really is the basis of biomimetics and epigenetics. Now, more specifically, let's talk about craniofacial epigenetics. What do you mean by craniofacial epigenetics? What are, we, what are you going to be doing in that craniofacial region? 
So here's a working definition. Creating a facial genetics, I'm going to use a person's natural genes. I'm going to correct and straighten the jaws, the teeth, the soft tissues, and the functional spaces. I'm going to do that painlessly using bio and medic appliances. So the emphasis again is on natural genes. This is not transgenics. This is not GMO. This is the genes that you inherited and the genes that you will keep for the rest of your life. We're going to use those genes to remodel the craniofacial structures, the jaws, the teeth, the soft tissues, and the functional spaces, which is predominantly the upper airway. The great thing is that because we're using a biomedic approach, the protocol will be painless. It will be pain-free. And the reason we can say that is that when a child is growing, they typically don't complain of pain. Pain is due to inflammation. It's a pathologic condition. Growth and development is a physiologic condition. And as long as we don't um, exceed the biological boundaries, it will be a pain-free process, pretty much free of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is not good for the body. It causes premature aging. And so we want to decrease the inflammatory process and work within that physiological limit. So here's our uh, definitions. Um, at the bottom here, I've got epigenetic orthodontics. So yes, we can straighten the teeth to a greater or lesser extent. So it's almost like a cosmetic treatment. But the thing is, there will be health benefits. And this is the kind of key in terms of not only looking good, but actually feeling good. Now, we can actually um, start to improve the tooth alignment because we're going to be doing epigenetic orthopedics. And that involves both bone formation and bone remodeling. And so I'll show you studies that we've done to show that we can actually increase the bone volume of the midface in adults with no surgery and no drugs. And now once that bone is being formed, it will be remodeled so you have a larger version, a better version of the same thing. So we can move teeth, we can remodel bone, and what that leads to is the pneumopedics, which means that we can non-surgically uh, modulate and remodel the upper airway. So um, let's go on a little bit further here, and uh, we'll Before talk we do, about... Dave, yes. should we launch our, uh, our first of three poll questions for the audience at uh, this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. Please go on. Yeah, why don't we do that? Uh, we're going to go ahead and launch the question, and please take a few moments to answer. Uh, those of you who, who are not driving, uh, the question is, are you currently treating patients for sleep apnea? And it's a simple yes or no. With 50% of the votes in, let's just give it a few more seconds. Uh, as I mentioned, I know a lot of you dial in and are not sometimes actually able to view the presentation, which makes it difficult to respond to the poll. But it uh, looks like most of you are on. We're, uh, we're up to 3 quarters, 76%. Give it another 10 seconds, because I know it's not a hard question. <laughs> Just some people may need a minute to get to their, to their, uh, their button. Five more seconds. All right, with 80% of the votes, uh, of the attendees voting, uh, we have 67% uh, yes and 33% no. Well, that's a interesting. Very interesting. Statistic. Very yeah. interesting. Number of people already, already uh, offering this service to their patients in, in some w way, shape, or form. Well, that is uh, very good information. About two thirds of the audience. Uh, that's critically important for us because. You know, we're really targeting a very uh, important condition. It's a, it's a life-threatening condition. And the reverse is that if you're able to really um, improve that, you can improve a patient's uh, longevity and the quality of their life. And so um, I'm glad to hear that this, you know, uh, the majority of people here are working in the area. Now, let's, uh, let's go on a little bit further, Danny, if we will. And let's ask another question. Um, what makes craniofacial genetics different from traditional dental alveolar orthodontics? So we know that orthodontics is focused on you know tooth alignment and getting very nice smile aesthetics. 
So what's the difference between these two protocols? And quite simply, craniofacial epigenetics is aimed at the overall health of the craniofacial region. And it does that by providing treatment protocols that address the underlying etiology of the signs and symptoms of sleep apnea, uh, TMD, malocclusions, etc. So craniofacial epigenetics is a broader umbrella and it will include you know, the orthodontic uh, protocols downstream from that. And so what we're looking at is the overall health of the craniofacial region. So what that means is things like brain health. And brain health could be you know, short term and long term. So let's say you have a child who has, you know, not doing well in school, has behavioral issues, you know, that's looking at brain health, you know, and what we know is kids who sleep well, their grades go up, okay? Now, that's kind of, you know, let's take an older person, you know, things like dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, those are things that happen later on in life. And so, if we are able to have a healthier brain, which is well oxygenated, the chances of having, you know, those kind of conditions is reduced. So think about brain health, you know, think about upper airway health. So the craniofacial region is so important because it houses the, you know, the most kind of uh, the, the initial part of the upper airway, which is so important to get an oxygen into the body and get the blood saturated. Um, so overall of the craniofacial region, Think about brain health, and a very acute uh, example would be athletes. Some of these athletes are prone to concussions. And so if we can um, enhance the craniofacial architecture, we can actually reduce the rates of concussions and improve the performance of some of these athletes. Craniofacial health includes temporomandibular joint health. And so we're saying, why are the teeth not straight? Why does this patient have TMJ issues? Why does this patient have sleep apnea? Or why is this patient snoring? We want to look at the underlying etiology and try to address that by doing craniofacial enhancement if we can. So another question I'm asked is, what makes the new Apedics protocol different from mandibular advancement devices? So we know that mandibular advancement is a well-known protocol for addressing sleep apnea in large numbers of patients. But here's an example of a case that was sent to us quite recently. And this um, patient has been wearing a mandibular advancement device for about five years. Now, initially, you know, uh, the patient got some kind of, you know, good uh, response. But now, five years later, he's got this very severe anterior open crossbite. He's got this posterior crossbite on both sides. And the worst thing is that, you know, there's no more mandibular advancement available in this patient. And if you take the device away, he has now severe sleep apnea. So when we look at patients, diagnosis is, in, is incredibly important because some of these patients may or may not be appropriate for mandibular advancement devices in isolation. Now, you can use whatever device you like. But we have to think about what would be a slightly better way of preventing those kind of conditions from happening. Let's take a similar patient who was following that biomimetic protocol for the last five years. And you can see how his occlusion is the, at that time. The teeth are um, pretty much in occlusion, and we don't see any huge dysfunction there. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the kind of subtle but significant differences between current protocols and the new neopedic protocol that we are advocating. <coughs> Excuse me. How did these concepts arise? What we see here uh, on the screen is uh, a teenager, and he'd been treated for cleft lip and palate by having mid-facial surgery, and you can see that the mid-face here is deficient. And so his mid-face has been brought forward surgically using distraction osteogenesis. This is the MRI of the same patient. You can see the deficiency of mid-facial bone here. And here he is after the distraction osteogenesis surgery. The MRI shows increased kind of bone changes in the anterior part of his face, which explains why he had a nicer facial profile. The question is, 
the surgery was done back here, and so how did those changes occur on the anterior part of the face? And the answer probably is through the remodeling process. So surgically, the mid-face was brought forward in space. The body detected those changes and remodeled that bone and gave a much nicer facial profile. So we did that study on several patients. And then what I did is looked at the mid-sagittal slice from the MRI. This is going back almost like 10 years. And looking at how those facial morphologies changed. I'm using finite element analysis. Analysis. The red means about a 30% increase in size. And we can see the facial profile has improved as expected. We see the mid-facial volume has also increased as expected. But then there's another red area right about here. And what that represents is the upper airway. Now, remember that these teenagers, the only intervention they had was surgical um, correction of the mid-face using distraction oxygenesis. They didn't have any mandibular surgery done. The only thing that was done was to work on the mid-facial components. So now we have to ask them the question, can we achieve these types of results non-surgically? So if we can rephrase the question, can we achieve similar results epigenetically? Now we've known for a while that it's possible to do mid-facial development in children and possibly in adults. It's an old technique which is previously called powerful expansion. So can we use that as a starting point to say, how can we get mid-facial redevelopment? So before we do that, clinically, let's look at the idea behind it. So here's a spatial matrix hypothesis published at the University of Michigan in 2004. And what it's saying is that during growth, the spatial function alignment of the skeletal element is maintained through remodeling the bony surfaces, including the periodontium to permit function. So what it's saying is that when a child is growing, the maxilla and mandible, they're kept in coordination through remodeling of the bone. And whilst the bone is growing and being remodeled, the teeth are going to erupt to permit function. And so now you've got the periodontium there. So that's all well and good, except that what happens in real life is that there are environmentally induced changes. So these are normal kids. So there's no genetic component here. They're just growing up normally. But there are environmentally induced changes. And what I mean by that is, let's say a child starts to suck their thumb, or has a pacifier, or is bottle fed. And so what that does, it changes the early morphologic relationship. So instead of the teeth erupting into a classroom occlusion, this child now has you know, an increased overbite, or an increased overjet. And now they're a class two. So genetically, they're supposed to be a class one. But what you've done is change the phenotype epigenetically and made it into a class two. So what we have here is a variation in the phenotype, phenotypic variation without changing the underlying genes. So what's going to happen next is the body will respond to that because this new phenotype, this new solution, represents a departure from the genetically encoded body plan. The body plan is expecting the teeth to be in a class one occlusion in all cases all the time. And we know that through a thing called temporospatial patterning, each cell in the body knows where it is in space. And it has a specific function in that, uh, in that region. So the body's picking up this departure from the body plan. The body's supposed to be symmetric. It's supposed to have 32 teeth. And those changes are going to be detected. So what the body does it undergoes a thing called developmental compensation. And the compensation permits compromised function. So I can eat, but my teeth are crooked. I can chew, but I get jaw pain. I can breathe, but I'm snoring at night. And so this is compromised function. So the body works, but it's not optimal. And this is the, um, the developmental compensation that occurs during this growth you? and do on face. Yes. I'm sorry, I may be the only one who doesn't know, but what is TORI? TORI is tori, mandibular tori, or palsal tori. And so you can have a palsal torus, or a mandibular torus, and uh, if you have more than one, it becomes tori. So it's just a plural. Okay? Okay. Yep. Thanks Thank for the you. question, Danny. Yeah. Now, so what the body has done is undergone this compensation. Now let's think about it this way. You're driving from, you know, 
from New York to Chicago, and the GPS system in your car says, turn left, and then you turn right by mistake. What happens then is recalculation, it says do a U-turn and come all the way back. So the developmental compensation is the recalculation the body does because it's got the body plan encoded in the genetic blueprint. So it's comparing what you have clinically in real life with what the body expected genetically. And so what the body will do is try to compensate for that, saying you know, do a U-turn, come back to where you are supposed to be if you possibly can. And that is what we're going to do clinically. We're going to do decompensation. Uh, decompensation is done through appropriate spatial signaling. Remember, the body components know where they are in space. And so if you change their spatial alignment, the body will pick that up and try to reestablish the genomic pattern formation for the best form and the best function. So. Clinically, if you've got a class 2 case with an increased overjet, I'm going to bring the mandible forwards. If I've got a narrow palate, I'm going to widen the palate. If I've got a posterior crossbite, I'm going to have to correct the spatial relations, so on and so forth. If I've got a deep bite, I'm going to increase the vertical. So step one for the correction is simply the decompensation, bringing the components close to where they, be, where they should be. So let's say that the mandible is off-center and there's a midline discrepancy. I'm going to physically move the mandible closer to the midline of the body. And then what's going to happen is the body's going to remodel the tissues into that new spatial matrix if you have the appropriate signaling. So you think it's a good idea? Well, here's a paper that just came out um, just last year. And what it says is mind the gap genetic manipulation of basic cranial growth chondroses modulates uh, calvarial and facial shape in mice through epigenetic interactions. So this is a very interesting paper. So what is the gap that they're referring to? Mind the gap. What do they mean by that? The gap in my mind is the genomic thesis saying that the genes are going to determine the phenotype and the epigenetic antithesis which is saying you can change the phenotype without changing the genes. Now, in between those two extremes, we have the genomic thesis, the anti, we have the epigenetic antithesis, and what we have in between those is the resolving synthesis. You take those two bits and make them work for us clinically. So what happened in this case, in this paper, is that they changed the cranial base in these mice, and they did it by doing a genetic intervention. They genetically induced a mutation, so the cranial base of these mice was different. Now remember, the face of the mice was not changed any way genetically, but they got a facial shape change in the mice through epigenetic interactions. And so what we're saying here is that we can use epigenetics to modulate, change, remodel the facial shape in humans. Because what we know is that there's homology in the human genome, which means that mice, monkeys, and man those, uh, those uh, species all have homology. In other words, if a gene produces a tooth in a mouse, that gene probably produces a tooth in a monkey and probably produces a tooth in a man. Okay? And so there's good scientific foundation to show that there's you know, a support for the idea of epigenetics and clinical correction. So what about pneumopedics? What do you mean by pneumopedics? Well, this is the actual clinical protocol of non-surgical upper airway modeling, and it may result from treatment with a biomedical oral appliance. So what do you mean by that, and how does it work? Well, the biomedical oral appliances, we're going to apply the principles of epigenetics, and we use the person's naturally occurring genes to correct craniofacial deficiencies. So remember, if you've got small jaws, you've got crowded teeth, you've got a small airway, of tissues and we're going to and we model them over a period of time. We're going to change the structure of the upper airway non-surgically. The great thing is the protocol is pain-free, it's minimally invasive, it's drug-free, there's no medications or injections. It sounds too good to be true, but this is genetic potential. The human genome is robust. It's taken thousands of years, millennia, to get it to this point of refinement. 
And so what it's built for is survivability. You want to have longevity and you want to have health. Let's harness the power of your own genes. So during that pneumopedic protocol, what actually happens is the craniofacial region undergoes structural changes, so the functional changes of the upper airway increase volumetrically, and I'll show you that in a few moments. So what happens is you have improved basic functions, such as breathing during sleep. Now, if you want to be healthy, there's two or three things that you want to get really under control. Number one is what you eat. Number two is your lifestyle in terms of activity. And number three is the quality and the quantity of your sleep. So let's get those three things under control. And here we're talking specifically about breathing and sleeping. And because of this pneumopedic uh, protocol, we can use this system of uh, biomedical appliances to treat, reduce, and eventually eliminate sleep apnea because it's going to redevelop that upper airway. Think about someone who's obese, overweight. They get on a, on a good nutritional diet. They start working out in the gym and improve their exercise routine, and they lose weight. They increase their muscle tone. They increase the uh, density of their bones. And so what we're doing here is saying, can we use the genes to improve the health of the upper airway in a kind of similar manner to kind of working out in the gym, you know, can we do something similar to redevelop the airway and remodel it over a period of time? And these are our adult patients that I'm talking about. So if we're going to be working with adult patients, let's look at the dental arch morphology in these adult patients with sleep apnea. So here's a sleep study that we did on 108 patients. It was done in a university ENT sleep department. And what we looked at is the size of the upper jaw and the size of the lower jaw in patients with sleep apnea and patients who didn't have sleep apnea. And as you might have guessed, the patients with sleep apnea, they had a smaller upper jaw. And what this color coding shows you, the circular scale shows you, is the direction in which the change occurred. It's like a concentric collapse of the upper jaw. And at the same time, the lower jaw, the mandible, became narrower. So these patients may be retronaphic, but in addition, they have a deficiency in the mid face. So it's almost as if they've got bimaxillary retrognathia. The mandible is retruded, retrognathic, but that's kind of almost like an optic illusion. Our eyes will see the chin is receded, but what we won't see is the fact that the mid-face is deficient, and so that mandible doesn't have sufficient functional space to move into. And so what we want to actually do is target the mid-face, and then allow the mandible to come into that new functional space. So here's an example of a patient who presented to the office with sleep apnea. Now, you How would you feel about happened. polling our audience just briefly, David? Uh, Dave, sorry. Sure, absolutely. Sure. Because uh, we, we wanted to get a little background, just gauge our audience on their experience yes. with uh, orthodontics, uh, to what mm. extent they're offering that in their practice. So let's go ahead and launch that poll, if you don't mind, real briefly. Sure, uh, no, absolutely. And, and the question B, do you have any orthodontic experience with either children? or adults, do you offer this in your practice? Please please take a moment to answer that question. Okay, we've got two thirds of those in attendance voting. Excuse me, let's give it another 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. Two thirds, I mean, three quarters have voted. A couple more seconds. All right, we're going to close the polling with 60% uh, uh, do have some experience. 62% make that. Awesome. Well, that's wonderful because um, even though this is not an orthodontic protocol, having that kind of background will only help you in terms of how to manage these patients. And sometimes, you know, it's required as a finishing procedure once the sleep apnea has been uh, corrected. But again, you don't need to be an orthodontist to do this. The vast majority of the uh, practitioners who are working with us are general dentists. 
uh, of course, we welcome our orthopedic colleagues as well. Um, but the point I'm making here is that you don't necessarily need to have orthodontic background. But if you do, it's a plus, it's a bonus. So let's so, go uh, to the next slide here. I, I imagine yes. in some in some instances there's a even in, in, in perhaps a, an opportunity to rethink uh, some of the uh, traditional approaches to orthodontic treatment, which is what you've already uh, shared. Sure, absolutely. And so that's a good point, uh, Danny, because you know here's a, a patient that uh, presented a set of sleep apnea, and you can see that she had you know orthodontic treatment as a youngster, and her teeth were very well aligned, and everything was fine. But over a period of time, um, you know the teeth have become crowded, and there's some kind of uh, some kind of relapse here. But again, that's not her main concern. The concern here is that you know, the diagnosis of sleep apnea. So what we're going to do this patient is saying, well, let's recapture the functional space. And now what we see is the space for the first three molars has been pretty much recaptured, not quite there. A um, bit more refinement needs to be done. Because what the body is looking for here is functional space. Now, the spaces that you see between the two teeth here, what is filling that space? Well, underlying the mucosa here is bone. And so if teeth start to become spaced, it's showing you that the underlying bone volume is probably increasing. I say probably because if you start to tip the teeth, then you'll get spaces, and that's not part of the protocol here. And so what we want to do is allow those teeth to move with the bone, increase the bone volume, increase the amount of functional space, which means that the tongue can actually sit on the palate for the first time and not fall back into the throat when this patient is asleep. So that is kind of an idea in terms of where we're going with this. So let's take an adult case. She's 38 years old, diagnosed with moderate sleep apnea. And this is the first case that we did, a uh, published case that we did back in 2011 with Dr. Sue Wendling, who's from Oregon, uh, Lake Oswego. So you can see a similar um, idea here where the premolars have been extracted for authentic reasons. And what we've done is recaptured some of that bone volume in the anterior section here. The teeth are spaced because it localizes space to the premolar region, in this case, as we did in the previous case. In this case, the patient uh, did not want to the implant done, but just some buildups to um, close those spaces at the end of treatment. But you can see in a period of about a year or so, um, the intermolar width, and that's the bone width, the mesial palatal groove of the first molar at the cervical margin, it's actually the bone width here, increased from about 34 to about 39 millimeters. And there's the bone volume there. Now look at his airway volume during that time after treatment was finished. Here's the calm beam pre-treatment and here's the airway post-treatment. And the upper airway volume actually increased by about 70% from about 12.8 cc's to about 22 cc's. So here's the first patient that we're able to measure and show in 3D that the airway volume actually increases there. And next you can see the reconstruction of the airway here. You can see the site of obstruction airway after about 18 months. Now remember there is not in the mouth when either the sleep study is done or when the 3D calm beam analysis is done. So now the question is if his airway volume increased in size to his sleep apnea. Well, before treatment, his apnea hypop index was 24 events per hour, which is moderate sleep apnea. And after about a year or so, it's come down to about three. It's less than five. And remember, no device in this patient's mouth when the sleep study is done. So this was the first time we were able to show that it may be possible to potentially cure sleep apnea in of these adult patients. And if you look at this um, case, um, after treatment, you know, the, the tooth alignment looks good. Um, he's been filled here with some very nice veneer, just medic finish at the end. And we can see the head posture has also improved after about 12 months or so. And so this is really the craniofacial enhancement that I mentioned earlier on. Now, the study that I've just shown you was uh, cited in 2013. And these are authors in sleep and breathing. What they are saying is the published studies show evidence of calm beam measured anatomic airway changes with surgery and dental appliance treatment for OSA. 
So the dental appliance they're referring to is the case that I just showed in the previous slide. So we were the first people to show that you can actually anatomically change the airway on a comb beam um, for these patients diagnosed with sleep apnea. Here's another case. Uh, she's been coming to the dental office on the device when she's sleeping. And what I want to show you here is kind of the cosmetic enhancement of that facial appearance in this young lady. And her upper arch, the teeth are a little bit better aligned. The lower arch, you see the teeth are slightly better aligned also. But look at the position of her tongue. See the asymmetry of the tongue here before treatment? It's become more symmetric after treatment, and it's more space for the tongue to be accommodated in the palate. And we know that the bone volume increased in this patient because the gray represents the comb being pre-treatment, the blue is the post-treatment, and they've been superimposed. It's mostly blue on the right side of the patient, which means that the maxilla has got wider and larger on the right side predominantly. The mandible has moved into the right side. So why do you get this asymmetric change? But let's look at the patient's face. And what we see is that the nose is obstructed on the right side of the patient's face. So the body is remodeling the maxilla, making it more symmetric, and getting more functional space inside the patient's nose for improved breathing. And her airway, the upper airway, increase in volume from 17 to about 28 cc's. So here was a second example where you can actually volumetrically measure the airway changes into adult patients pre and post treatment and show how it improved. So this is what we mean by the pneumopedic effect. And remember that the studies are done with no device in the patient's mouth. And this is a different example. This is a patient who is 60 years old, that's six zero. And here's a pre-treatment airway before the treatment was done. And here it is after treatment. That took about 18 to 24 months. And you can see the airway has virtually doubled in size. And so this is showing you the pneumopedic effect. What happens with the teeth and the jaws as you start to develop the mid-phase? If you follow the protocol, there will be no spacing between the teeth or little spacing between the teeth, and the bone width seems to get wider. So is there an increased bone width in these adult patients? Notice there's no diastema or spacing between the teeth. Does the bone actually get wider? We actually measured it, and in average, it went from 33 to about 35 and a half millimeters. Does, so the bone does get wider. Does the bone volume increase in these adults? In the example here, we from four to about 15 cc's. That's about a cc of bone. And then if you look at the actual study, we were awarded the whole price for that in 2013. The bone volume increased on average from about 17 to about 19 cc's. And so there's about two cc's of bone in these adult patients. Our colleagues from Europe did the same study, but they did it surgically. They did it surgically assisted rapid maxillary expansion. So now we're going to compare the pneumopedic protocol and this surgically assisted protocol. And what they found is positive distances in the right and left post of segments of the maxilla indicating lateral expansion. So did the bone get wider? Yes, it did. But the anterior region showed negative distances, posterior displacement of the anterior or the segment. So when you do it surgically, the bone does get wider, but it's at the expense of an anterior retraction. And you can see the bone is green and green. It got wider here transversely got wider, but the anterior region showed a negative change that was retraction. So here's a patient who's been told that he's a surgical candidate, but he doesn't want to have surgery. And so we, want, we don't want to bring the man any further forwards in this case. He doesn't want to have surgery. So what we're going to do is we're going to do mid-facial redevelopment on this 24-year-old adult. You see the anterior and posterior cross bites on both sides. Here is pre-treatment, and here is about just down through. Again, the study was done, and no drug was used, and we were able to increase that mid-facial bone volume for this adult patient. Here's a different patient. We're going to again look at the intermolar width. So the calm bean has been superimposed at pre- and post-treatment. Pre-treatment, the intermolar width was um, 31 millimeters, and post-treatment increased about 35 and a half. Airway, you can see the airway 
it, from the lateral point of view, it went from two and five to four and a half, and about eight behind the tongue. So that's what we mean by the new orthopedic effect. As you start to redevelop the mid-phase, the airway is simultaneously. Danny, did you have a question there? No, I. Uh, we were kind of okay, losing you a little bit. Did you? Uh, okay. But let me see. I. I uh, yeah, I do have a question. If you don't mind answering uh, on the fly, that's fine. We have a question. Uh, is this traditional or Invisalign as well? Uh, sorry, so the question is. What is the question, Danny? Well, this was. Uh, I think it was just submitted. Uh, is this traditional or Invisalign as well? Is this? Uh, um, you know. Yes, so we are not using any Invisalign. If I'm not sure of you right now, that there's no Invisalign. You finishing procedure, if you wish. Cases are showing this case on the screen right now. I don't use any Invisalign or any other technique for that. Uh, so it depends on the case. Most of the cases, I will say about a third of the cases you can finish with this device alone. About a third of the cases, we you know, use a clear aligner. You know, there's different as up, there's visible, clear correct. There's all these different um, clear aligners on there, and so uh, you can use. Well, you need to get this medic finished out here if you need it. So looking at this case, from 31 to 35 and a half, the airway improved, and then you see the models where the arch has been improved. And this is her appearance uh, before we see here. It is about uh, 24 months later. And again, no, I should be a biomedical detail to get that cranial facial coating. Different patient densities gain a new big effect. Uh, the upper airway is to start with a half. In a 13 and a half behind the palate. Shoulder half behind the tongue, and you can see the mandible has moved forward. This is the uh, new page for that. So if you move forward into and enhance the upper airway, it remodels into that space. That's what we mean by the new big effect. You can see the upper airway void in way, and here is the end. Um, it starts to level uh, the body one conceptual area again. Uh, the doubles in size with 27 and a half and the professional area is also very significantly increased. Again, no device in the patient's mouth when the sleep studies are done and when the C D counts are done. The can be in the daytime and the sleep studies done at night. And there's a relation between the two. So we are able to use the bone now and the because yeah. the nasal cavity volume increase, we know that the floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth. It's a thumb. And so if the palate is being wider, what happens with the nasal cavity? So here's a case study. She tried with her holds, right like this, three uh, on the breathing. If she's not doing well, it's just the mouth breathing. And she goes to the palate. She the photos a little bit out of, I um, have to uh, uh, apologize for that. Uh, but you can see her 12, um, actually 24 later, and her facial part has improved. And again, you see the lower lip is rolled out here, she's the mouth done. When she's uh, finished, you see the change. The radio is adenoid, which is causing the nasal obstruction. And you can see how the nasal obstruction surgically in the device. Again, you can see the nasal obstruction in the panel here. You see the clear patches. Um, you can see her occlusion, uh, the anterior crossbody has improved the treatment. So she's breathing better, she's feeling better. She's not breathing through her nose, she's better to school. Over the rent, uh, 
this dissertation is showing you her progress after about a year. And we can measure the distance from the nasal septum and the interior concha and the nose that should get any wider with uh, therapy. So the distance septum here and the concha is about 0 0.1. And about a year later, it improves about 1.36. So that was a young patient that's showing these changes in a nasal airway. It's an adult patient, and this patient is from 1.7 to 1.2. 2.5, 3 And so measuring the distance and the here, the nasal septum, and the concha here. So remember this is a functional aspect that I'm concerned about. People become kind of concerned uh, with the fish. It's no huge problem as long as you have the functional space on both sides. So if the septum is deviated and obstructing on one side, then we need to try to increase the functional space to and the inferior concha. In the interval of the week from 57 to 40, but you can see that there is a little candy. patient now is nasal breathing. Um, we did a study earlier back in 1998. We looked at patients with cyanide, uh, with rhinos and cyanides. And what we found is that they tend to have this laterally positioned process. So here's the signs on both sides. We can bone yeah. this is in the process. Now, since it's an obstruction, the ENT cells will go in and modify the bony architecture. And our idea is to try to preserve it best we can. The job of the antenna is to protect the maxillary air sinuses. Nasal F. So let's just see on a um, here. You can see here's the sinus here, and as the air rushes into the nose, here's the antenate process. It's going to protect the maxillary air sinus from the airflow. So just think about driving on the freeway, and you see the orange cones. All the cars are going to start to divert off to one side or the other. So the antenna is like a traffic cone, it's diverting the airflow away from the air sinus. Now, if that is damaged or removed, then the inspired air is going to hurt it, it's pollutants, they contaminate the sinus. Okay? The job of the sinus, of course, is to produce a nitride, and so the nitride is produced inside the air sinus, it's picked up by the nasal airflow, and delivered down to the pulmonary alveola in the lungs. And so the pneumocyte in the sinus of the natural dilator, but if, it, if the sinus becomes contaminated, then you start getting sinusitis and problems. And so we want to try to um, preserve the nasal arc the best we can to protect the sinus. And if we don't do that, you know, some patients who have nasal surgery done, what happens becomes dysfunctional over a period of time. It's called nasal collapse. It's called empty nose syndrome. The ostia are wide open. But the sinus is not well ventilated, and it's not functional. And so what we want to do is try to preserve nasal as best we can to prevent these kind of complications of nasal surgery. So we work very closely with the anti colleague to see what is the best product we can use to help some of these patients with nasal obstruction. So here's a study that we did to see can we change the nasal cavity volume in our adult patients. And we took uh, these uh, cow beam scans. The patients were about 38 years old, took about 18 months of treatment. And the cases had mid-facial hypoplasia. And what I mean by that is things like a narrow palate, uh, maybe a posterior crossbite, and maybe an anterior crossbite, those kind of things. And so what this slide shows you is the volumetric reconstruction of nasal care. So we took the 3D calm beam. We're going to work on this very specifically to remove the excess from here and reconstruct the nose here in 3D. And so here's the reconstruction. The sinuses on both sides, the nasal cavity. You can start removing the sinuses and we're left with the nasal cavity on the for treatment and after treatment. And just give a test to see did the nasal cavity volume change in these adult patients? So let's look at nasal appearance 
of one of these um, kind of patients, you can see the asymmetry of the nares is kind of slightly narrower, it's kind of slightly broader. And look at the same patient after about 18 months, the nares has kind of opened up and become symmetric. And so that's going to enhance the flow into the nose because the upper inlet has improved. That's how kind of, you know, the breathe right nasal strips, that's how they work. They take the soft tissue, the ailer cartilage of the nose, and bend them upwards. And we've done that without a device on the outside of the nose by wearing a device on the inside of the mouth. But what happened to the nasal cavity in this patient's on average increased from about 39.8 to 42.3 cc's in the period of about 18 months. And actually, we got a small crop prize for showing that years back. So here's our call from Europe. And they're going to do exactly the same thing, but they're going to do surgically. They're going to do surgical matter expansion to measure the volume changes of the nasal airway. And the little story short, on an average, and the higher I find after the surgery has been done, and the nasal air volume increased in 9.7 area. So let's see what they did. The first in three parts. First of all, we did a Lafon osteotomy. Second, we did a Mizan osteotomy. And third, we did the Tagum maxillary disjunction. So they took the maxilla and basically split it horizontally, vertically down the midline. And then after that was done, they put it in a Hyrex appliance for a tissue bone distractor, and the patient wore that 24 7. And these are two examples of the post treatment results. And you can see that you know the the nasal capture is when we're going to be looking at. We know that it got uh, uh, increased volume by nine point seven percent. But what we see are these huge diastomas, which need to be closed at the treatment. You compare that with a non-surgical protocol, where we have you know increased nasality volume. But there's no between this uh, in this example. This is pre-treatment. This is post-treatment. Both of these are post-treatment. You can see a big diastema here and here, but not in this case. So if we compare the two protocols, the surgical procedure was in three parts for one part, mid and the terrible mix with my in of no surgery. The average treatment time in this study was within two months across the the wear time of the device after the surgery was for seven months other ranks or instructor. In our protocol, that you wear a device 16 hours per day, late afternoon, early evening, all night, but not during the day. Sample size was 7, when the first 9.7, up to 5.6. You got a very large data, and we got no deaths in all cases. So we have a choice. You can actually do the uh, protocol surgically, or you can do it non surgically. And that is a decision that you and your patients will have to arrive at. But let's look at a patient who took part in the study. Here she is um, before treatment. We can see she has very narrow nares, she's not obvious malocclusion, and she's kind of double chin, a wide neck, and so the uh, diagnosis here includes sleep apnea. And this is the same patient after about 18 months or so, and she looks like a happier and a healthier patient. And so this is showing you some of the genetic potential that's available for these adult patients. Now, if that nasal cavity volume did increase, what would be the effect on adults who've been diagnosed with sleep apnea? So we said the bone volume increases. We said the nasal cavity volume increases. What would happen to the sleep apnea in these patients? So let's do a study to see if the upper airway can be enhanced in patients diagnosed with sleep apnea. So a CPAP, a lifelong CPAP, might become avoidable in some of these cases. So here's the study that we did. They're being uh, the adults of the age of 21, mild pneumonia. The house sleep test was interpreted by a board certification or by a single dentist or a ribbon, and she's got advanced training in sleep medicine. The apnea hypothesis of the study samples are no appliance the mouth when the sleep studies are done. What did we find? On average, the sleep apnea was 13, decreased to 4, 
and statistically significant 68% decrease in the HI. And again, no apply. Some of these patients, this one here, not this one, but some of these patients here, not this one here, are less than five, which means that these three only eliminated. I presented World Association of Fleet Medicine in 2015, and I can say that paper was very received with a lot of excitement from my medical colleagues. And the paper has been published, and again, what the studies show is that there was no device in the patient's mouth when the sleep study was done, and the amnia hypopnea index came back at less than four of those cases. Now, what about patients with So here's a 27-year-old female lady, and uh, she's uh, presented to the dental with signs and symptoms today. Uh, TMJ issues, and she was screened for sleep apnea, and the healthy they came out with an HIA of 105, which is, you know, she for a PSG, it came back an HIA of 118, okay? So this patient has a ENT surgeons, and they did it for her, to me, the age I came to 70, that's 70, still severe so she was advised to be controlled on CPAP. Uh, unfortunately, as a young lady, she did not like the CPAP, and couldn't tell her very well. So she wants a different uh, protocol, so we said we can get my system and see what happens, and she was in you know, it for about nine months with CPAP because she had severe sleep amnia. But after about a month ago, when the sleep study was done, the age came down to one, not deeper. So the sleep study was repeated on six occasions, six different nights. You did the sleep come back and on. Is the um, appearance of that patient? Uh, you can see that the airway is obstructed. Here's a tongue. The tonsils are almost touching, kind of kissing tongs. You can see the part behind here. And you can see the airway uh, post treatment. And this is the sleep study that was three weeks um, with no device in the patient's mouth at all. She even the last three weeks with no device in the patient's mouth. She goes to the sleep study and uh, what the uh, we found is the middle area is faulty, and this patient has no feedback without the device in the patient's mouth. So the potential uh, product uh, that can be used in moderate and severe cases, and here's a the problem of severe cases, you can see that at 10 months, the age from about 46 down to about 16 and a half, 64 percent reduction on average, with no device in the patient's mouth when this is actually being done. So this is a uh, work in progress, but it shows you that the study has been published, and you it may be possible to work with the patient's mild, moderate, even severe amnesia, moving and get sleeping physiologically increase the quality and the quantity of the sleep. So uh, we're coming up to 5.45 um, uh, local time. And in conclusion, what we can say that can be obtained in ingrained models. And what I suggest is that there's a genetically coded mechanism that can be regulated by these biomedical appliances to enhance the upper so these are the key words showing you what we do and how we do it. So what we believe is there's an underlying genetic mechanism, and we're trying to use the body's genetic itself. Just think about getting injured. So you, you sustain a cut or you know you bruise, break a bone. The body's first intention is to undergo a healing process. Now we. Right, so this is a bone fracture. You put a, you know, a cast and move a crutch, you know, to allow the bone to heal, 
And when the healing process is done, you start removing the crutch and you remove the cast and you're back to a physiological state. So think about that in terms of how we rehabilitate the eyeway. We could put a splint in there. It could be a pneumatic splint uh, in terms of you blowing air down the of the CPAP, or it could be a pharyngeal stent or a device that goes in the pit. But it's there for a kind of um, a finite uh, amount of time to all the blood healing process to go on. Eventually, you wean them off the device. And so, what we are suggesting is that these findings may help dentists manage patients with sleep apnea, use this pneumopedic and a protocol and the underlying uh, concept of craniofacial um, epigenetics. So that uh, pretty much brings the uh, presentation to a close. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, you know, we're working with Louisiana State University. We did a, a training uh, um, kind of class for their faculty, medical faculty in the San we then returned there in May of this year, and we trained um, a whole bunch of dentists as well. And so the idea is to work with the university hospitals. Um, LSU is one of the institutions, and what we are doing currently is running a curriculum. It's going to be a one-year full-time fellowship in sleep medicine for dentists. And so the road to specialization. So here's a one-year program. Uh, fellowship program and um, hasn't been launched we're hoping to launch that in the early part of 2017. Now once you've had that one year fellowship we are always very close with the American Sleep and Beauty Academy and looking to make pneumopedics a, a subject so at the end of the one year fellowship the board exams with the American Sleep and Beauty Academy then you'd be a specialist in sleep medicine or in sleep medicine, a dental specialist in dental sleep medicine. And that, of course, will bring and we and I mentioned the specific medical codes that go with this protocol. And they are above and beyond the typical codes that are being used for some of the other devices. Now, you can use whatever call device you wish. I'm just looking forward in terms of how we can help the dental and the patient to get a slightly better outcome in all of those domains. Um, so just to finish off, you know, we do have uh, training uh, events um, the next two held in my office here in Milton, Oregon. Uh, the uh, 30th uh, the end of month. Now typically um, what we're going to do is um, um, the special uh, offer practice perfection well, with additional 10% discount. Here's some of that. So um, typically, you know, we put a, a kind of a price on these, uh, a fee for this. Um, so if you visit our website or if you want to um, call us, the officer, uh, we'll be able to for training. Uh, the first part is print craniofacial development, look at diagnostics very carefully here, we'll talk about medical billing. And the second thing is more focused by the way, a bit more focused on sleep in medicine, and it brings in the uh, medical billing. And both of these um, uh, events include a one-day clinical orientation, which to see patients and see some positive being tested. Um, so if you have an interest in there, I would encourage you to back there. Uh, and uh, to help you with that. Um, Danny, are you at the time? If there, there's some time for questions, um, if there are any queries. Well, there are indeed, and uh, thanks very much. That was that's fascinating, and uh, the uh, the amount of research uh, or the opportunity that this offers dentists to make such a, a lasting difference through some really. Uh, uh, Revolutionary, I think, approach is based on the science. Uh, it, it, I think it's, in, I think it's incredible. Uh, we do have some questions about the fellowship that you just mentioned, and uh, thanks for extending the the discount to our uh, attendees too. Uh, I'm, I think people gather just by the 
what they heard from you the past less than hour and a half that uh, they're going to get their money's worth and then some if they choose to attend the course. So thank you again for that. Let's 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 indeed dive into these questions. And I apologize. Uh, some people uh, send me chat that they were having trouble with the audio. Rest assured, we will be sending you a uh, link to this recording so that you can uh, fast forward and uh, and hear whatever sections that you uh, might have had some some trouble with. All right. Uh, the first question was: Are these devices FDA approved? Yes, and you may have missed yeah, um, beginning of the uh, presentation. So I'm going to scroll all the way back here. And uh, you recall that what I said is that uh, just if I can go to the very end of this uh, uh, presentation, um, the thing that I mentioned is that uh, let's just do view and let's just get that slide. This one here. Um, so here is um, that that it shows that the company is registered as a medical device to the FDA. So we've been given said from the get-go pretty much um, the time of the day, I think it was. All of the devices are FDA. And so they've been on, if you go to the FDA website, you can see some of them. And specifically, the M FDA compiled to moderate sleep apnea. And the question is yes. And you are very cognizant to work on the uh, practice premises and the rules relation with the same. So the upside to that is the medical learning enhanced some of those freedoms. All right, very good. Uh, next question is one able to request reimbursement from medical health insurers for this treatment? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So here's the way to do that is that we actually work with and she's been working in the medical insurance industry for, I'm going to say, 20, 25, 30 years. She's a young lady, she knows her staff. And we'll do for us to get specific medical details for the DNA plant system, including the MRA appliance. So the thing to do is to set up a medical model in the dental office. So what she does with the medical exam. So we have a network of medical to medical physicians right across the US. She will hook you up with one of the individuals and you will be working with that medical professional to make sure that you can access the medical billing codes. There's a procedure involved, okay? Now look that you're using the medical billing codes, you could use those for a mandibular advancement device. However, if you use any of these devices that I've just mentioned, the medical billing companies such as, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, TRICARE, you know, they recognize that this is above and beyond the typical oral appliance, so you get enhanced the investment. And what I mean by that, up to double the regular rate. So let's, let's just say an example, let's say you've got 3,500, now, for a single device, you'll get double that rate, um, depending on what coverage that your specific patient has. But we've seen um, handsome reimbursement through the medical billing procedures. Well, that's good news. I suspect you go th into this in more depth during your uh, your uh, seminar as well. Yes, Joel Clinton is from the speakers the seminar that she threw in shows you uh, some staff. It's a great idea to bring your staff with you. And then she will follow the post with you by training or helping you to get the system, you know, put together and actually do the billing for you if it comes to that. So, yeah, we follow up on that quite diligently. And, uh, again, it's a procedure. It's if you follow this systematically, you know, you can get some very handsome investments from that. Yep. That's an often stated concern I hear, obviously, understandably, reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also uh, find your approach you know, encouraging also that, that you have a physician that uh, that does the diagnosis and then the, uh, the mm -hmm. treatment is passed back to the dentist, which, you know, historically there's a lot of uh, 
leakage under the traditional model where the dentist refers to a physician as they must for uh, the diagnosis of the obstructive sleep apnea condition and then the physician will just prescribe a, a CPAP instead of really the other way around where I think it makes more sense from everybody's perspective that the first line of treatment ought to be some sort of oral appliance, uh, some sort of approach that you're taking and then sure. CPAP if it, uh, you know, if that's necessary, that can be the last line, the last resort. It uh, saves everybody money, and it's uh, less invasive, and, you know, everybody sure. wins. Well, you know, we actually spoke at the sleep meeting in Denver, Colorado, uh, this past uh, this past month. They actually, and there was a lot of interest in our medical sleep, because they have cases non-compliant with that, or factory cases as well. So now we're actually looking for dentists who are doing this type of procedure because it gives them yet another option to help patients. Mm -hmm. um, so we get a lot of interest from our medical colleagues, whereby the World Sleep Federation, and the speaker there, 2017, our ET colleague, the speaker, Benjamin, also. But we're getting a lot of um, uptake from colleagues is looking for well appointed dentists who they can collaborate with. So, you know, I think it's a really good time to be involved in this type of work. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, are these devices covered by dental insurance? I think you may have addressed that, but if you don't mind answering you know, it. Sure. So the short answer is, you know, if you want to, you know, so uh, let's take a child. That's a very good, very good question. Let's take a child. Now, what is called for sleep family in children, currently it's surgical or a CPAP. So are they going to have adenoids or tonsils, you know, surgically removed, or are they going to put them on a CPAP type of device? Now, what we can do is take the DNA appliances, for example, which are the ones, and use a dental or an orthodontic drought, and say, I'm going to do the treatment and we can increase the jaw size, and that will obviously be addressing what And so we're going to be looking at the pediatric population very carefully in the next few months. And uh, so that's really good work in progress. So yes, you can use the or dental codes. And the fact that you use the medical codes at the beginning means that the dental codes are untouched. And so you can still use the limited orthodontic treatment or lifetime or whatever you want to do. Um, as to ask them to an additional, you know, procedure once you've got the sleep apnea under control. Excellent. Uh, if a patient doesn't have arch width discrepancy, can you just start them with an mRNA appliance? Um, what we do the dentistic um, workup, and we do a you know three dimensional, uh, you know, analysis. Um, we do the two things. First of all, we look at the sleep study, and then two, we look at the 3D comb beam, and then we work out the severity of the obstruction. So a patient who's got, um, you know, a walk with no oxygen, why would they have sleep apnea? So we need to find out what's going on with those types of patients. Now we have to look at, you know, the nasal airway, the nasal airway, retroglossal airway, looking at the whole thing in 3D. And so, you know, the first thing we say is that we ask a series of questions like a clinical algorithm in terms of a work, workflow to say, is this patient suitable? Question number one is, is the maxilla abnormal? In other words, they've got a high volt palate, they've got an anterior crossbite, they've got crowding, any of those, would that be, yes, is yes, then it's possible in case. But if it's already wide, then we've got to say, where is it coming from? Now, if you hit the thing you MR science, just the top of my head, I'm just going to say an older patient that's been diagnosed with sleep apnea okay, and has a class two clinical presentation. So, you know, in kind of in a nutshell, is how I would differentiate between DNA cases and between the mRNA cases. So we make no assumptions, and we start to look at the 
a sleep study, does that patient actually sleep? What is the quality of their sleep? I mean, the HI may be really low, the arousals may be very high. So we need to look at these patients very carefully, making no assumptions, and saying what is the best device for this and say when it's fine, if it's a surgical procedure, fine. We're going to look at this patient and see what can we possibly do for each, each individual place. So I don't rule out anything, and we're going to be able to say, you know, if there is an artery crap, we can you know, work with that, and if there isn't, let's find out where the sleep apnea is coming from. There may be some other sites of obstruction. Makes sense. Uh, then uh, finally, a uh, two-part question from uh, Dr. R.B. How predictable is this therapy, and what are the restrictions in case selection? The risks. So number one is uh, we go by the uh, Hippocratic Oath. Number one is do no harm. So if it's sleep amnia, we want to resolve that if we can without causing any other side effect if possible. Number two, and that is the whole, the whole analysis point. And part three is um, be better than placebo. In other words, be better than doing anything. Okay. So that's how we approach these cases. Now, what could possibly go wrong? Well, before I go there, let's look at medical advancement devices, which is the main, if you will, of you know applying therapy currently. People care problems with the TMJ, they get problems with the bite change and the occlusion, and the initial changes. And that's with the long term, and we're seeing that long term. If you're not on the device, the sleep apnea gets worse. So now here's a patient that's been wearing the device for 10, 15, 20 years, okay, it's away from them, and the sleep apnea has got so that's a risk that we have the current uh, protocol. The thing is we know that if you look at our patients' airways, not all airways are the same. So just open their airways, AP, section, their face unilaterally, okay, kind of front of us, and some bit their airways trickling. So if you've got a patient who opens their airway sad baby direction and give it to the device it's gonna be uh, a really good patient. But two thirds of the patients don't know. And so we have to say you gotta get good results in luck is most of the time. And so if we follow the protocol, that's what we are able to do. So we in the let's take Sue Wendling and the first time we with the device in the mouth. Let's take Tara Griff's picture over to A24. She did the same thing in different patients and got the same result. Kitty, Dr. Tamari Hai did the same thing. This year, Dr. Martin Cortez did the same Yes, presented at the Denver Colorado meeting and got the same result over again. So this, the hallmark of science is to be uh, repeatable consistent and independently achievable. And we've been there over the last five, six, seven years and we're getting better and better results. We just finished a training uh, event uh, this past weekend. Is that what was severe exam in the So she was by a medical doctor to this practitioner saying, I've heard you use a slightly different protocol. Can you on my patient? The patient with the next year is that 28 in the period of about months. The patient's finished, but she's showing dramatic improvement. Now, what we were monitoring at the same time was this patient's blood pressure. And for the first time in her life, her blood pressure is under control because the device seems to be targeting the airway for correction. So, more research needs to be done looking at patients who are obese, patients with hypertension, patients with mild, moderate, and severe sleep apnea. Um, but currently, the results seem to be showing a degree of reliability and repeatability. With LSU, you know, their clinics talk to us, um, the University of Hospitals, 
the audience is saying, let's do some larger scale studies to show how reliable this protocol is. Uh, between you and me, I'm pretty, I'm pretty done, but let's see how we try to work them. Oh, well, thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, we are just a little bit uh, over. So, uh, but that was that was fantastic. I want to thank you for the uh, really important and truly fascinating pre presentation on a topic, which, as I said, offers such great promise to improve patient outcomes while increasing practice income, and also for the generous offer for our attendees to uh, see you in person in Beaverton, Oregon. In a few days, you will receive an email with instructions on how to apply to receive your CE credit. Now I invite you to mark your calendars for our next exciting webcast, which is scheduled for Thursday, July 28th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, when my very special guest will be founding fellow founding AOSH member and my friend Doug Thompson. Dr. Thompson's presentation is entitled The Integration of Oral and Medical Health and will present implementation strategies for wellness opportunities in the restorative dental practice, as well as networking tools for continuous growth. Until then, this is Danny Bobro thanking you for your continued commitment to practice perfection. And again, special thanks to you, Professor Singh, and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>